Okay, uh, now we're going to have uh, Mickey and Jesse discuss the UEFI exploitation of the annoying bios stuff that I know I personally hate. So uh, give it up. Can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, I'm Mickey. That's Jesse. We work for a company called Eclipsium. So far, introductions. Uh, by the way, that's our uh, Twitter handles. Uh, we are free to ask any questions, DM us, has, pester us, catch us in the hallway, anything. Just feel free. Uh, during our talk, we're going to talk about a few things. The, the big picture is uh, I'm going to have to bring you up a little bit on what it is to set up a debug environment, the, uh, what is the UEFI exploitation techniques, uh, specifically the exploit that we found, the vulnerability that we find and we exploit it, and a few more things that we recommend you do. Basic acronyms. Anyone here does not know what BIO stands for? I assume everyone does. Um, UEFI is basically the newest name for BIOS. Uh, DCI is the acronym for Direct Connect Interface. There's been a lot of research about that in the last year and a half. Uh, interesting stuff. I recommend you read up on it. Uh, SMM is a privileged mode that the <clears throat> uh, CPU runs in, and uh, you should read up on that too. And out of band, obviously. A couple of people you should uh, really follow and read up on the research in this field. Uh, the ones that have an Apple on them and a censored mark, they work for Apple now. Uh, you don't see a lot of research coming out of people that go work for Apple. But they do have a lot of past research. And the reason we've added and more is because once you start looking into these names, you'd see more and more names pop up. Uh, for example, not necessarily UEFI, but some DMA in UEFI. I'd like to point out Ulf Frisk sitting right there. <laughs> Check out his research. Or more, just pester him later. He'll tell you everything he does. He's awesome. And Joe Grant also asked him stuff. But why, why, why should we care about, about BIOS and UEFI, right? So um, I say, I, suck, I don't know, someone did this study about who is actually, who, who actually cares about their firmware security. And it turns out that a lot of people, bless you, a lot of people don't really care or mind it. You know, you, put, you, you power on your system, like if you're a consumer. It boots up, there's a fancy logo, and then you go do your thing in, in Windows and everyone's freaking out every time ransomware comes out. Uh, no, one, no one thinks about that little piece of code that runs first when you boot up your machine and owns everything and sets up everything and configures everything and hands it off to the OS. Um, the, this is a, a, a very convoluted diagram for how this works. Complex, I'm gonna simplify this. The little BIOS window there, it's where the stage where you go into BIOS and do settings. Ever, anyone here done any, went into BIOS and changed the setting because they had to? Isn't that fun? <laughs> right? So that's where that does. That stage, was, where that, that happens. And the Windows logo over there, it's where the, the operating system is, is at. So you can see there's a lot of stuff happening before runtime or operating system. From an attacker's perspective, when, when you want to attack this, this piece of firmware, um, you target whatever stage you want according to your payload. If you want to implant a piece of firmware, you want to have some persistency, there, there are known um, backdoors, uh, the SMM, the famous Dima's uh, um, SMM backdoor and GitHub and, and others, and hacking team and Vault 7, I can go on. And, um, you just implant it in the firmware and you're good. If you want to do in, in, in the operating system stage when you're in, you're in runtime, it's a, different, it's a different attack surface for the firmware. Right? There's different stages where the BIOS and firmware go at since you power on the machine and until it hand off, hands off to the OS. And that's like really simplified. Again, as an attacker, I care about two things. Let's, let's say, let's all imagine that we want to hack someone. Like, and we're nation state, or not nation state, or we know how to get into this person hotel room and 
get, get our hands on their laptop for 10 minutes. There's two ways we can do this. One, we can open the laptop, get all the covers in the back, flash the chip, read it, flash it, change it, whatever, put it back together, the classic evil made attack. Or we can do this with the laptop closed. So that's an interesting attack vector we can do with uh, uh, debug enabled. Um, in, in, in Intel's case, uh, there are scenarios where if debug is enabled, you can have uh, USB access. That's all you need. Just plug in a USB cable, and you can do a lot of interesting things we're going to show you in a bit. Let's see. I'm going to show you a video and I hope I can show it with this. Okay, we have audio. That's a shortened video of our evil made attack. So we, we have a laptop that we're going to infect with a, an SMM backdoor using a flash programmer, opening the laptop, removing the heat sink because the spy is under the heat sink. Flashing the spy, which is the longest process in all of this. 90 seconds to flash the spy chip, put it back together, and that's it. So let's enjoy the one minute ahead of you. The red that you saw at the end, that was the SMM backdoor demo wrote. It's loading. Just an indication that from the beginning you load into Windows, and then uh, afterwards you load into a backdoor and then Windows. Yeah. I do apologize. The rest of the videos don't have the soundtrack. How the hell? Okay. That's it. Now, I've added a slide with uh, a couple of reference notes. Uh, these CVEs are specifically for BIOS and firmware vulnerabilities. Uh, I'm not going to go into them. I'm just going to give a high level. They involve um, SMI exploitation, SMI vulnerabilities, and, and so on and so forth. They check them out later. Now for the fun part. Now, to get started with, with um, low-level hardware debug or, or firmware debug, you need a couple of things. Uh, Intel, Studio, Intel Studio Debug is, is free to download. It's a three-month uh, uh, trial, I think, that you can renew every three months. It's awesome. A UEFI tool, uh, amazing tool. It basically helps view the UEFI images, um, view the, the parts in them, extract them, replace them. Chipsec is a tool for hardware and firmware security exploration, I would say. It, if you ever wanted to go into how the hardware in your computer works and you don't want to sit down and write a Windows driver, use Chipsec. Uh, IFR, Universal IFR extra Extractor, that's a, 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 an amazing tool. Um, you basically, you, you use this and on, on a BIOS image. I'm not going to go how to use each tool, but it allows you to get the, the, the details from the setup variable that are not usually shown to the user. All right, some of these are very interesting, and if you flip them on and off, you can get interesting behavior. A lot of BIOS modders use this. Uh, I, I really enjoy reading their blog posts, how they brick their systems, but um, 
be careful. <laughs> it's, really, it's really a good tool. It's been around since a long time ago. And um, two other important things. One is you need a USB to, USB-A to USB-A cable. Uh, it costs 15 bucks from some vendor that I don't know, but maybe has his name on the slide. Um, it's totally worth it. I would get it if I were you. And the la last but not least, you need to have a USB that allows you to boot into a UEFI shell. Now, um, there are plenty of tools out there in the internet that are um, used for many platforms, for many scenarios. You can just put it on your shell, load it up, and play with. Uh, there's too many to list. I really recommend you start looking around. Now that you have a knowledge of what tools you, you, can, you can deal with, like, to go a little bit deeper. Um, for the Intel hardware debug interface, um, I need to reference some, some information here. Uh, so the CVE you see mentioned here is, is our own CVE. We reported to Intel. Uh, about the DCI vulnerability and got patched in a way that um, changed, changed policy for all, all the vendors in, in BIOS. It's, in, it's interesting because it, it stops you from enabling debug interface. It supposedly ha needs to stop you. I didn't validate it, but you should uh, note that. Uh, Intel, in, Intel Studio Debug, once you have that, it's like five gigs, you download, you install it, has a whole set of tools. All you care about is the debugger. That's it. And the debug abstraction layer, which is an important thing, it's a command line interface, the debugger. So we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the UI and the command line. So I am, I, I, I'm a Windows guy, I'm sorry. I like a lot of GUI. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on that and I'm gonna add a little bit of command line just for all you Linux people. So when, when, you, when you have this installed, you go and you find the Intel DAL fo folder on your hard drive and you find uh, config console.exe. You can't see what it says. I, I hope you can. Uh, it's a bit, uh, resolution's a bit off. But you get a, a menu like that. It's, a, it's part of the Intel Studio debug. You go into your drop down and you select your target. It's abbreviated. So for example, KB, KBL is KB Lake, SKL is Sky Lake, and so on and so forth. The biggest, um, if you wanna find what, what is what, you find the CPU of your target, you go the little numbers and K or whatever, I7, you go into Intel Arc, you put that in the in, in Arc and it gives you product formerly known as KB Lake. And then you know KB Lake, what can that be? KBL. There's no one-to-one -one reference anywhere. So once you have that set, you, you click apply, and then you click on that weird red button to connect to Masterframe. Masterframe is a service running in the background that connects you, your, your, your computer, your host, to your target using the, um, the USB debug. Um, after you do that, you have a service connected to that, and you're good. After that, you open the debug studio and in there, you have a button, connect the target. You select the out of band, and it's important you click on DFX abstraction layer configuration. That reference to the previous um, drop down menu. Now, I'm, I'm like doing this explanation because it's not obvious. If you, if you, um, if you try to figure this out, it's gonna take a while, and you're gonna be like frustrated. Why is this not working? For example, uh, our target platform that we're using is um, an eighth gen Coffee Lake ASRock system with a 370 chipset that you can see the option. It's like somewhere in the middle, second from the bottom. It's literally there. You just select it and click it. So you don't have to go all through this convoluted process of selecting the, pro the, the target platform and clicking and going and setting it up. But some platforms do not have this. So if you do want to use the GUI, this is a great tip to, to know how to fix that. You don't have to get specifically the hardware that works with us. On the command line side, you have the Python console.cmd. It's a, um, it's a, the CLI for 
Python and, I, and, and ITP, it loads everything together. Uh, it's in the same folder as config console is at. You just run it and it starts booting up and, and setting everything up and then you get something like this. ITP is the namespace and when you, when you do itp.halt, it halts the CPU, which is by itself amazing. <laughs> and then in this example, we set a breakpoint in SMM, we, we issue an SMI, we let the process continue, and then the next breakpoint is SMM entry breakpoint. This is the, uh, the script that actually does it, if you want to automate this. Excuse me. Um, all it does is basically halts the CPU, sets the breakpoint to SMM enter, issues an I.O. for SMI, lets the CPU go, waits until the breakpoint is stripped, until the CPU gets the SMI, is in the breakpoint, gets the SMM physical base address, and uses memsafe to dump the entire SMRAM and then releases the, the CPU. In the GUI, it's much nice and GUI-ish. So um, you have this drop down when you create a breakpoint. You can create a hardware breakpoint, a, a software breakpoint, or other. Uh, I always use the hardware breakpoints. In there you can choose if, if, you, if you pause on code or on data being accessed or platform. If you choose platform, the in, Debug Studio comes with these built-in options. Now I don't know about you all, but having the ability to have a debugger pause the system in a VM exit is not trivial. Or machine check, or SMM enter. Like th these things are not something you can do with GDB. It's not something you can really like, oh, I'll do it later. It's really stopping everything. If we set a breakpoint in SMM enter in the GUI, it would look something like this. You'd see a little yellow mark where you're stopping execution. You'd see the, the address right here. I'm showing that uh, we stopped at that address and, and the, um, the SMRAM ba physical base addresses. That number, so you can obviously, we're, we're in SMRAM, we're running. And you can step, uh, step through, step into, step out of. It's exactly like any other debugger. It's amazing. Another interesting option here is the reset vector. So um, in, in modern platform for the last 30 years, every time um, the silicon gets powers on, powered on, it does its own, the chip does its own silicon stuff, and then it goes and it stops, and it loads a specific address that it has set up in it like, that basically sets the reset vector for the firmware. Like execution is handed off from the chip, to the firmware, and then the firmware then loads to the OS, and then the bootloaders and all that stuff. The reset vector has always been the same place in, in, in the last 30 years, and breaking on it means that you get to stop the machine before BIOS has configured anything. No protections, no memory, nothing. Before even BIOS loads, you can do whatever you want. This is, uh, this is how it looks when you, when you halt on it. Uh, you have write back and validate, which is uh, an, an example of one system. This is on a Skylake system. In the Coffee Lake, it's nop nop, and then it jumps to the next uh, instruction. The address is the same on every platform. Oh. Now I'm going to go to the fun part and let Jesse do that. So, so we've looked a little bit about. So we, we've looked a little bit about how uh, to use some of these de debug interfaces and what to do. But uh, as far as like actually finding vulnerability and what we can do with it, um, one of the the most interesting areas is there. There's been a lot of uh, network cap capabilities added to UEFI, and some of those are things like over the internet updates from BIOS itself, from UEFI. Uh, we found a BIOS that could send email. Uh, there's another one that does, it'll download a remote diagnostics tool over the internet, run the application, and provide results back somewhere else to the, to the internet before your operating system loads at all. So as, as part of like looking around at all these different features, we, we discovered that uh, uh, two different vendors had vulnerabilities in their uh, 
uh, internet-based uh, UEFI update mechanism. One of them was RASROC. RASROC uh, we reported that to them, and they were like, oh, crap, let's fix this, and basically uh, made a firmware BIOS UEFI updates for around 300 different motherboards that were all affected by this. It basically was anything from Haswell onward from ASRock was affected by this. Uh, they, do, they do have some uh, AMD mod models also that were affected. I think it was a much smaller number. It was like 27 motherboards. But uh, we also found a, so this is the, the exploit that we're going to walk through and explain how to actually take advantage of this. Uh, we found a, basically a, essentially the same bug in uh, ASRock's firmware. And uh, this is the response that we got back from ASRock, or ASUS. ASUS. This is ASUS, sorry. ASRock is fine. ASRock is fine. As ASUS, we kind of went back and forth be between them and explaining, like, you should maybe fix this. And they're like, no, th this all happens before the operating system loads, so it's fine. It's not a problem. <laughs> and it's like, no, like, the operating system, like, it's even more privileged because it's before the operating system. So they didn't actually bother to fix this. So it concerns me a little bit because like my desktop at home is an ASUS system and it's vulnerable to this also and I'd like them to make a patch. So here's an example of what the, the user interface looks like in BIOS. You can basically go in and uh, this is uh, ASRock's implementation. Uh, it'll, it'll show you if there's an update available, you can apply it. Um, Here's what uh, uh, ASUS's implementation looks like. It's essentially the same functionality, just implemented differently. Uh, it's, this is all vendor-specific add-ons to the, ba the base uh, Tiana Core UEFI reference code implementation. So we'll do a little bit of a, a walkthrough of like what the actual exploit was, and then we'll explain how to take advantage of that and how to build a payload to actually exploit this. So. As Mickey mentioned, this was a, uh, a Coffee Lake ASRock latest latest updates. Everything was uh, up to date. So uh, in, in this case, basically, it does a plain HTTP request from BIOS to a remote server on the internet. It brings up the network connection using DHCP and makes plain HTTP requests. So there's no, no SSL, no certificate pinning. Like, there's no verification that it actually is talking to the right server. Or and that you have a man in the middle that you haven't poisoned the attacks so the request to goes to your server or something like that. So they're not doing any of that. Uh, here's let's see. So here's what the uh, result looks like. It, it's basically just an XML document that has some fields like here are different URLs you can download this BIOS update for. Here's the version that uh, is available. Uh, here's the description of it. Here's the the actual file name itself. And if if you uh, modify this, you basically show up with like, here's, here's my malicious update, go, go apply that. But uh, we discovered that, like, here's the uh, exploit. So we discovered that if you, uh, if you just have a long, really long URL field, it doesn't even get to the point of asking you, saying, hey, there's a new update available. It just hangs. And you're like, that's interesting. What happened here? So. Uh, in order to figure out what actually happened, uh, we'll have to start using those uh, hardware debug tools. But to get started, we'll just start off with a simple payload where uh, in that URL uh, uh, XML tag for the, the response we're returning, we're just going to put a, a long string of A's and see what happens. What happens. So once you've uh, used uh, uh, Mickey's process to uh, attach the debug the hardware debug tools and get into Intel system de uh, debugger, you basically have an environment that looks kind of like this. It's a sim it's, you, have, you have the ability to look at memory, uh, check the state of the CPU. Uh, the, the really key thing to do uh, to figure out what actually happened is uh, in, in user mode applications or even kernel, you'll usually get some kind of system log of what happened. Uh, when, when you cause a, uh, uh, an exception in BIOS, it usually just hangs. And it goes to an exception handler and then goes to an infinite loop, and you don't know what's going on. Um, so what you, you'll, what you, what you want to do is basically find the interrupt handlers for a general protection fault. And you can do that by there's this uh, menu option for 
looking at CPU structures and GDT. And then on the bottom right here, you can see here's the different handlers. And the, uh, the offset of general production fault is listed here in the very, very far right. So that address you can then go set a hardware breakpoint on and uh, use this, basically go to that address and say create breakpoint at that address. So then when we trigger this, we can actually have this halt and then examine the state of the system from that point. So when, when we do this, we basically end up where we've halted at the, the entry point for the interrupt for the general protection fault vector. And you can see in the, uh, the upper right, here's the state of the registers and the, the 40, 40, 41s are basically our A characters that showed up in two of the registers that we've seen so far. So we've clearly overflowed something in the stack. There's this register state that's been corrupted. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good sign so far. So we can go then take a look at it and uh, Basically, uh, it's it's not quite as intuitive as GDB and like other kernel debug features that you can use. So, you, in order to actually figure out where this faulted, uh, we're going to take a look at the uh, the stack pointer and see the, there's a, basically when it goes into this into this uh, exception, uh, it it puts the state of the machine on the onto the stack. So we can basically look at the, the stack pointer and use this function that's just show memory. And if you take a look here, it, it basically puts the memory of, of that address down at the bottom and we can see like there's, there's a 64-bit uh, value that's pushed and then the next 64-bit value on the stack is the address of the instruction that faulted. So we can kind of navigate around a little bit and see what happened and find the exact line of code that crashed. It's, it's not quite as intuitive as some of the other debuggers, but it's, it's useful. So. Um, in, in, in this case, uh, let's see, when, when we uh, take a look at that instruction that we actually halted at, it turns out that it was a return instruction. So we, we basically faulted when we were trying to return uh, because our pointer was bad. So that's a, a pretty good sign because it, it implies that we control the return address and we can have arbitrary code execution at this point. But th there's some, Things, things to look about for if you actually turn this into a real exploit. And what there's some general constraints for your payload. So this is 64-bit uh, uh, mode. So you're going to have larger pointers, and your shell code needs to be 64-bit. And because this is a string copy from a document onto the stack, we need to avoid null characters. And we also need to avoid like greater than, less than, symbols because they, they would mess with our uh, XML document. So there's like a few bad characters we need to avoid. And then as part of our exploration and, and exploring the uh, debugs uh, environment, uh, we were able to determine that uh, we, we really need a very small and precise size for the, the length of the, of the string because if, if we have too many bytes, uh, we end up dereferencing a pointer that crashes before we get to the return address. So it needs to be exactly 255 bytes. So we have, we have some constraints, but I think we can work with this. So in, in order to verify that we are actually executing instructions and we have remote code execution, we just build a basic uh, exploit where instead of the, the long string of A's, we have our NOPs led, and then just a, a single instruction to do an infinite loop and then our target return address to try and jump into the NOP sled. And it's, it's pretty, pretty simple. So once we, we trigger this, we basically verify that we did hit our NOP sled. And when we, when we halt the processor, we, we basically, you can see there, there's a little yellow tick at the very left of that infinite loop instruction. So we, are, we halted the processor. It was in that busy loop. That's all it's doing. So. We, we did confirm we have arbitrary code, in, arbitrary code injection and the stack is executable. So that makes it even easier. So that, that's basically what we've determined here. It's like we, we have verified that, that we can execute instructions. Uh, there's no address randomization, which is, makes things easier also. And the stack is executable. But because we had that limit where it has to be uh, 255 bytes exactly, we need to figure out what we can do and what we can put into that uh, space. So what, one other thing we could do is like we're limited 
to the 255 bytes for that particular uh, field, but we have the rest of the XML document. It turns out that if you just append stuff to the end of the XML document, that also shows up in memory. And uh, one, one, one thing that we can do is we can just look and see if we have a pointer that already, ex that already points at that XML document. So we'll just take a look at all the different registers and see if we get lucky. So we can use the show memory and check each of the different registers. And it turns out that uh, R10, the R10 register happens to point into the heap. It's not exactly at the XML document, but it's close. If we, we basically look at R10 and then search backwards in memory uh, from that pointer, we find our full XML document and it's, it's there. And then we can, we can take advantage of this by basically building our exploit to, instead of having our infinite loop, we basically have code that searches backwards from the R10 pointer in order to find a, a tag. We basically, it's, we just used a, a little eight byte string of A's and that worked. You could put whatever you want to have as your tag to search for, but we basically have on the on the stack overflow is our initial payload, and we use that to find the the rest of the uh, the payload in the heap. Um, once once you're actually stepping through that, there's some some pretty useful functions within the the debugger. So uh, in order to get past that, so. It, when I first started debugging this in order to figure out what was going on, I, I will really often add an infinite loop at a particular point. It's like I can add a breakpoint anywhere in my payload. One issue that we run into using the hardware debugging breakpoints is that you will often need to, like after you cycle the power of the system, you'll often need to enable and re-enable the breakpoint and then go trigger your exploit. If you just add an infinite loop in, you can effectively have the same thing, but then when you're running, you basically need to say, I, I want to skip this instruction. So you can just use this move PC to line and, and set the, set the uh, instruction pointer to whatever you want. So that's a, a really common thing that you end up using. And then maybe there's like a long loop to do things like copy things or search memory, you, and you can use this function just run to line. It's, uh, it's similar to like GDB functionality, but I kind of wanted to point out where to find these things and uh, what you can use this for. So at this point, we've basically uh, found our, our, two, our second stage payload and we can jump to that. We have a lot more room, but the question is like, what do we actually do with our second stage payload? And in order to really understand that, like we don't have a operating system loaded. So like running bin bash using a, an AD syscall isn't gonna work. So like all of, all these, these traditional things you've seen in other types of shell code just doesn't exist. Like we don't even have like your Windows kernel or Linux kernel or anything like that where you can patch functions in it and then basically escalate privilege of a user mode app. None of that works. So let's talk a little bit about what the UEFI environment actually looks like and then we can have a better idea of like the types of capabilities that exist that we can take advantage of. So we're, we're gonna give a, an overview of like the applications, like overall, structure of what an application looks like. And then uh, protocols is a really key thing to know. And then system table, boot services, and runtime services are all kind of important things in UEFI. But for, so the applications themselves are basically just a Windows PE executable. And instead of like, you, you might be familiar with like, like argv and argc arguments being passed in. UEFI applications basically are passed a a uh, pointer to uh, the, the handle to the executable that was loaded itself, and then a pointer to the system table. And the system table is, uh, you, you can find all these other functionality that exists inside of UEFI from the system table. Like, like I mentioned, there's a full network stack. Uh, there's a lot of rich functionality that we can take advantage of. And to, to actually use those functions, we need to know about what protocols are. It's essentially kind of a, uh, so it's a protocol interface that is used to, uh, for, it's a inter, inter component uh, mechanism such that it's one piece of functionality that wants to provide uh, a type of interface, like maybe it handles network connections. 
uh, it will uh, publish its interface by GUID. So you could say, this is a well-known number. I am a completely different application, and I want to use this. And uh, yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll look it up by GUID, and then I can basically do function calls into this other piece of functionality. It's essentially like object-oriented programming classes. So it's, it's, a really function, it's a really key uh, part of UEFI, and everything is built on top of this architecture. And uh, so the system table contains pointers to boot services and runtime services, um, some other uh, useful things. Boot services have a, a bunch of functions like memory handling, protocol operations, uh, loading and starting other UEFI applications, and then exit boot services. Exit boot services is basically what happens v at the very end before you actually launch the operating system. Uh, runtime services does like capsule operations, variable operations. Um, the, the, the most important boot services functions that we have are locate protocol, which will allow you to find other pieces of functionality within the UEFI architecture and go use that function. Uh, load image will basically allow you to load a uh, UEFI application and then start image will run that. So those are both things we can use. So first we need to find the boot services pointer and it turns out that uh, those are actually saved as part of the standard UEFI application framework. So it gets passed a pointer to the system table and then the initial, the code will basically save those in global variables. But because we don't have address randomization, we can predict, predict where those global variables are. And then our, our payload basically ends up looking like this, where we've got our second stage, which has basically code to call this uh, load image and start image shellcode. The, the load image uh, function, you, you can either provide a path to go get it out of a firmware volume, or you can give it a buffer in memory and actually execute code directly that way. So we'll, we'll have code to basically load and start an arbitrary UEFI application. And one problem that we ran into is that right before the return instruction that we uh, overflowed, uh, they basically called a free function. So our, co our XML document and payload that we're running is in the heap, but if we trigger any, any allocations, it's gonna corrupt the heap and mess with our payload. So we want to avoid that, so we basically end up copying everything back to a different location, basically copying it out of the heap so that the heap will stay preserved and uh, things will work. So that actually ends up working, and I'll show a quick demo. Yeah. So th this is the uh, so th this is the uh, first demo that we actually uh, the the first exploit that we actually got working. So this is what the environment looks like. We're basically going to go launch the Internet Flash functionality. It'll go check for an update and uh, see what happens. So we, we, bas we basically were able to do, do some simple text mode uh, exploit. So we, we got code execution, it worked. <laughs> but we don't want to do this one yet, not yet. Okay. So let's see if I go back to this one. So that worked. So, but the problem is it's like, it wasn't great. We had limited space. The app was only up to about 12K or so. And uh, we also had some issues with our payload encoding. So it turns out that uh, if you try to use like MSF Venom to encode a 100K uh, Windows executable, it doesn't work great. So we, we basically made our own payload encoding, which is just a very simple, it's essentially just, uh, we, we thought about using Base64, but that includes a table. And we basically convert our UAFI application that we want to run into a long string of hex digits, map it all to a single set of, uh, uh, so, like, basically by, by having it, instead of 0 through 9, A to F, basically map those characters to A through P, we don't need to have any branches or logic, it just is a, a copy loop that basically looks like this. So you just subtract A from each byte, and then that is the nibble that you use to, to rebuild the, uh, the code. So that's what our decode steps are, looked like. So. 
we, we also needed to find a better place to actually uh, put our payload because it turned out we only had about 12K of space on the stack. So we explored and looked around a little bit before we uh, discovered some, remembered some uh, useful things. So UEFI applications all run in ring zero and there's no memory protection between the UEFI apps. So we can just write our code over some arbitrary UEFI that already exists memory and if it's one that we're not gonna trigger, we don't really care, it just works. So let's, let's try something bigger. I need that up. Okay. Yeah. So it's basically the same thing, triggering the exploit. And. <laughs> Uh, not, not yet, okay. so let's, let's uh, well, no, that, yeah, we should do that one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, that was, that was cool, but like, uh, it's not complete for that. so we, we, we figured let's actually pop a full shell and make, do something more interesting. So th this is there, there's a, there's the tool that Mickey mentioned, the UEFI shell, and uh, it basically is like a, a big 900, K executable, it's a meg, almost two megs, so it takes a little bit longer, but it's basically showing that we can run any arbitrary UEFI application that exists. You can make your own UEFI apps to do whatever you want, like the demos that we made, uh, the, the previous ones. So this is a full UEFI shell. It's about a two meg executable. You can, uh, you, you can run this and it just works. So let's see. Uh, so some other ideas are you, you basically you have a full network stack in UEFI. Um, you, you can just do a network connection yourself, download the third stage from the network instead. You could have a full command and control capability from BIOS. Uh, some some other ideas are there's there's decompression code built into UEFI. You could Decom you could compress, you could even encrypt your payload and use the functionality that exists in UEFI to do a bunch of more interesting things. Uh, this particular firmware image contains a NTFS driver, which you can use that. If, you're, if your hard drive is not encrypted, you could use this to mount the hard drive from UEFI and modify, uh, modify files in the file system, drop malware into the OS. You could exfiltrate data and email it from BIOS. You could do ransomware, all kinds of stuff, because there is a very rich functionality built into UEFI. Uh, if you don't have the NTVS one, you could just include it in the payload if, and bring it yourself. Uh, th this is actually what Hacking Team did with their UEFI implant. They had the NTFS driver and used that to drop an agent into the file system to have their malware running in the agent. So some of the mitigations that, that could, could work for this is adding stack protection randomization, non-executable stack. None of this exists in the UEFI reference code implementation. There's been discussions by UEFI, UEFI forum to start adding these features, but this doesn't exist now. And even if it did exist in the, the Tiano core reference implementation, the vendors have their own source tree. They basically pull from Tiano core and add all their own stuff. And then they put it out into a, a platform in the real world. And it takes a while for that to, to show up. So this doesn't exist, exist now, and it, it'll probably be a while before it is out there. So for, for recommendations for building your own exploits, uh, use the latest EDK. Like there, there are directly from GitHub, from the head. Uh, there have been like EDK package releases, but the latest one is, is best. They've fixed a bunch of things. And then there's also a GNU EFI package. If you, uh, so there's EDK kind of build environment and then there's a GNU EFI build environment and they're kind of a different structure. GNU EFI is like more of a Linux you make file kind of thing. And, but 
Uh, Ubuntu has a version that's like two years old, so go get the official one and use that instead. And do we have time for questions? I don't think so. We have one minute. <laughs> How much time we have? No time. Yeah. Okay. Okay.